Good morning, New Life, and welcome to our online experience. I'm Kyle Hamlin, your new student pastor. We're about to begin our worship part of our service where we're going to be singing songs of praise, and we hope that you are able to make your home, your living room, wherever you are watching this, a, a place of worship. So grab your coffee, get settled in, and be sure to sing really, really loud so all of your neighbors can hear you. Let's begin. I spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind Overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself. Was your foe still your love fought for me you have been so so good to me and I felt no worth you paid it all for me you have been so so kind Shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. I won't tear down coming after me. Yeah. So shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. So wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Yeah. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. Oh, it chases me down by 
nights till I found leaves the ninety-nine. I don't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God.
love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing. Of the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend, and I have lived in the goodness of God. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I have made. I will see of the goodness of God. Yeah. In all my life you have been faithful. In all my life you have been so, so good, yeah. With every breath that I am able, yes, I will see goodness of God. Yeah. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. In all my life, you have been faithful. In all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, as I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for worshiping with us. We've got just a few things that we want to share with you. Number one, just because we are isolated does not mean that we have to stay disconnected. We've been hearing stories of how you guys have been reaching out over the past few weeks, and we want to encourage you to continue to reach out to people and show them that you care about them, that you love them, that to continue to be the church. Number two, your church, New Life, we are reaching out to our community. We are still providing meals for Berkeley Medical. It's been really exciting to, to be able to build those meals and take them and, and just to show our appreciation for our hospitals and how they're serving our loved ones in our community. And our third thing that we want to share with you is that you can help us do more of that. The more money that we have uh, to be able to do that ministry, the more that we're able to share that love, to be able to spread that. You can give by two ways. One is by going to nlccwv.org and giving online. The second is being able to uh, mail in a check. You're always welcome to bring one by the church. Uh, but by continuing to give to this, we're able to spread that ministry out far, far, far. And we want to, to be able to be a part of that. God has prepared a special message for you today. Would you guys bow with me and let's pray over this message. 
Father, we're so excited to be with you and in your presence, and it's so exciting that you can be in our homes, in our living rooms, with our families. Uh, God, that you can be with us even whenever we feel isolated, even when we feel uh, scared or lonely. Uh, God, you are still here with us. God, we thank you uh, for people being able to pitch in and to continue to be the church and continue to give, God, because we know that you can do more with that money than we can. And God, we're just so thankful that we get to be a part of that tool uh, to be able to share your love. And God, just as we hear this message that you've laid on their hearts, God, we just pray that we're able to, to receive that, to take that home, God, to be able to dwell on that this week uh, and be able to apply it to our lives. God, we love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, New Life, and welcome to church. And for everyone joining in with us, whether you have been someone that has been with New Life for a long time or you just found your way into the fold, even if it may be virtually, we welcome you in. We welcome you to participate and to be a part and to grow with us as we continue as a church to progress. And I think it's a pretty amazing mark of what God's doing in us as uh, we've even added staff to our church uh, in this time. As they announced last week, we just took on our new youth pastor, Pastor Kyle Hamlin, um, amazing man, and I believe is going to lead our students so well as he takes over for me and the ministry at Lifelike of our students. I couldn't be more elated um, for what's coming, but also it also releases me to do that which God has been tugging at my heart to do. And a lot of people have been asking, what, what's in store for you? Where are you going? What's, what's happening? And uh, to make it clear, I am. if you missed the, the announcements previously, I'm sticking around here. I'm not leaving. Um, in fact, uh, I get to work uh, in some sectors and parts of our church that really um, God, I think, built me for. Um, really uh, hoping to mature the mature taking our believers deeper and the relationship with God with developing a different paths of, of success, of growth, and also uh, helping people to assimilate better into our church, uh, our groups, and everywhere else by creating all kinds of uh, systems and, uh, and initiatives and events and things. Uh, I will have my hands in all the platforms, hopefully, that will help people continue to grow at a pace that uh, sees us all fulfilling the vision of our church. Um, and so I'm looking forward to those uh, days to come where we're working normally together and seeing all that. But until that day, um, we have a hope. And I want to teach you about that hope. Um, we ha are finishing out our series today. I'm stepping in for Pastor Jim as we finish out. Uh, our series, Hope, is on the way. And uh, today I want to focus our attention on our greatest hope. Um, now, of course, we looked at the hope we have in Christ, it, His uh, burial and resurrection after His sacrifice on the cross, and what hope that gave us. And when any of us have received the hope of Christ into our hearts, that, that has uh, been the hope that, that then seals for us a hope that I want us to gaze at with great intention today and learn how to posture up so that we can not lose hope in what God has bought for us in our future. So I want to look at future things. I want to look at the age to come. I want to look at the hope we have and wait for. And really, because we need to learn how to wait. Um, we need to learn how to wait well. And, and the scriptures have a great deal to say about this. But to understand a little bit about waiting and its importance, we also have to understand, of course, um, what we're waiting for right? And I think most of you get what we're waiting for, but we're waiting for Jesus. And, and Jesus made it really clear to his uh, apostles. Um, he says, you know, if I go in John chapter 14, verse 14, he says, if I go, I'm going, and he's saying, going to heaven, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But he says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to take you with me. And that's a great hope as believers is that Jesus has not left us to this world. Um, and in a world right now where we see it, I mean, the, the world is not easy. There's sin and death and sickness and struggle. We have set a course of struggle that we're to walk, but that's not the end. And the hope we have is there is an end. 
There's an end to this suffering. And so we want to focus on that hope, and we want to focus on then the hope that is the coming king. That's our greatest hope. We have a king who is coming. And we don't often think in terms of nobility and kings and queens and things like that. We've never really truly had a king. And so it's hard a lot of times, it seems very fairy taleish to think about God in such terms and ways. But today I want to hopefully paint a picture for you uh, of why this is important and why a king really fits the, the, the bill for when we look at Jesus and what he is doing. Um, in fact, I maybe want to just start off with sharing a, a bit of a story that most of you have heard, but maybe a, a little spin on it that maybe you've never caught. Uh, if you've only seen the Disney version of, of Robin Hood, or uh, maybe my favorite from the 90s, you know, um, the, the, <laughs> the, the one with Kevin Costner, you remember? Uh, good stuff, good flick, but there's some missing pieces to this story. But we know the basic story of Robin Hood. Robin Hood was a, was a valiant uh, thief, one who uh, was stealing from the rich to give to the poor in a time of, of need when um, an evil er emperor, so to speak, ruled uh, named Prince John. Um, and he had taxed the people to such a degree that everyone was poor, and so they needed to steal from the rich to provide. Now, what the true story and history of this lore of this man named Robin Hood um, tells us is that he actually had come back from fighting in the Crusades with a great king, a king that had left his kingdom to go off to fight in the Crusades. Uh, his name was Richard the Lionheart. Now, uh, Robin Hood left that battle early, made his way all the way back to England from Jerusalem, quite a journey, and now he finds that his land has been seized and everything that he knew was gone, and now he is poor, even though he was of nobility, and, and he joins these merry men in a, a bit of their own crusade to, to aid the struggle of what once was a great kingdom. This kingdom was meant for greatness, um, and had a great king, but the king was off in a way. And uh, the end of the Robin Hood narrative that's not many in many stories or books, or, or excuse me, uh, movies, uh, but in, in writings, is that at the end of the story, the King Richard the Lionhearted comes back into uh, the kingdom. And he's making his way down through the Sherwood Forest, and there he meets Robin Hood, who attacks him to try to steal from him, thinking he had some money to give to the poor. Well, of course, that ensued into a wonderful uh, sword fight, and uh, when the sword fight went as long as to hoods to fall off, what Robin Hood realized was that this was his king, and he had come. And instead of fighting him, he received him. He bowed his knees and he, he gave his loyalty back to the king and helped the king once again usher in the good kingdom that he had to take back from his brother, Prince John, who had usurped him to be a puppet king, much like Satan has done, setting himself up on earth to rule as the prince of the air. Now, uh, Jesus is coming to vanquish Satan, and certainly stole his power in the death and resurrection uh, that we just celebrated last week. But what we still understand is, uh, though the battle is won and the crown is placed back on the right king, there still is a lot of land, a lot of domain of the king that is still suffering from the consequences of the enemy. And here we find ourselves in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis and we uh, hurt and struggle and we still understand the enemy really has always been sin and death. So that's why we hope because Christ has promised he's coming again. And when he does, he, when he does, he's coming to establish his reign on earth. His throne is in heaven as it's established there now, but his throne will be established. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 tells us this very plainly, that uh, when Jesus, the Son of Man, comes in his glory, this is verse 31, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne, and all the nations will be gathered before him, 
And guess what? As Revelations will tell us, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Listen, this is our great hope. But the problem that we face is, as Christians, we may know this. Maybe we're not fully aware why Jesus speaks so much about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And we talk uh, this language uh, all the time in the church about the kingdom, but it seems fairy ish But the truth is, the mighty one, the king, the all-authoritative one, the almighty, is coming back to finally be put on a throne. And that, uh, when that happens, he says, we will be granted the inheritance with him and we will reign with him in Christ. That's why it's a great hope because we hope for the days where sin is done away with. Now, I want to read a passage from Romans that uh, maybe can be grabbed at a little differently in light of what I just told you. Because here, uh, we don't often go here when we're talking about this, uh, I guess, piece of truth that I want us to grab onto, this hope, that hope is on the way. When we say hope is on the way, we truly mean that, that uh, hope has been bought in Christ and His cross and His, always His promises, but uh, hope is going to be completely fulfilled to the day, such to the point that hope will no longer be needed. Why? Because we only hope for things that we don't have. And one day we'll have it all in Christ. Isn't that awesome? And so uh, that's why Romans puts forth and Paul explaining about hope says this. He says, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Uh, Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now here's the problem. How patiently are we really waiting for the coming king? Um, I, I think we find ourselves in a, in a storyline that's pretty easily delineated. And as we learned in school, there's, there's those five different parts of a good story, right? You have that, that, that whole pl- that, that setting that starts us off with all the characters and getting to know. And then you have the plot as it thickens and there's the rise of the story to the climax of the story. And the climax always has a, a conflict that's built, and there's a building of that conflict in that story that's very important. And the conflict that, of course, in the narrative of man and God is sin. And then the climax of that story is Jesus conquered sin. And, and now the redemptive history of man is playing out in, the, in what we see as the, the decline. It's the, the falling action of the story. And that falling action ends in every good story like it does with the resolution. There's going to be a resolution. All will be resolved in a good story. Well, we're in a good story. Um, and why we have great hope that there's a, there's a resolution coming here. There, there's, a, there's a fix awaiting us, but we don't often think about it. And I think... It sometimes even scares us, and we want to just kind of fast forward. (laughs) We want to move past it, and I like that word fast forward And um, because if you're in my generation, you've been using that word. Uh, People uh, born in previous generations, that would have been a new word they had to learn at some point, but my whole life, I've been able to fast forward things. First, it was like tapes and then, you know, VCRs. Then now, everything in my life, I can look around and I can kind of microwave it, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but you may find yourself in the same frustrated state sometimes where I find myself you know, moving past my commercials. This generation knows nothing about what it's like to actually have to endure a segment of commercials to watch uh, an actual show. You know, that, was, uh, that is long gone because our generation now can just zoom past those inconveniences. And much of technological advances has have bought us this position that we can move past things at a quicker pace. In fact, I bet some of you have been tempted, if you haven't yet already, to uh, fast forward my message a little bit, you know, kind of get through it. Uh, Don't tell me you haven't done that. I know you just do that to Pastor Jim, but um, the truth is uh, I'm tempted by that. We're all, because we've become quite accustomed to this fast forward mindset. And 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm watching a show, and my wife really hates it when this happens, but I'll be fast-forwarding uh, through the commercials, and, and I don't know, but uh, the times two option isn't even really good enough for me for some reason, so I will often just hit it again and go to times three. I want to really zoom past that junk, you know, and what that often does is pushes me past where I wanted to be, and I miss what I wanted to see. And then I have to go back and try to find this really annoying, right? Man, I really wonder, what are we missing by our inability to be able to sit in and just pace with what's happening and wait on our coming Lord? Because waiting is this discipline that I think it needs to be enlisted in a better way in this time. Um, because as Romans tells us, we don't hope for things that we have. We, we only hope in things we don't have and we wait for. So if we are going to be people of hope, then we have to be able to wait. And if we can't wait, then it might show us why sometimes we don't have hope. And so as we look at, uh, I think, the greatest hope outstanding, and though it seems lofty or perhaps far away, uh, it's there and it needs to be understood in how we ought to wait for Jesus. How we ought to settle in in this time. Because I think a lot of us, we understand that we ought to wait. But how we do it maybe is more of a struggle. And I don't know if this sounds like your life at all. Um, but I say all this to say that um, if you've lost hope at all, if you feel like hopeless, and by the way, this generation has been noted to being one of the most hopeless generations. They, they don't see hope in the future. Um, it might be because we've some, become so accustomed uh, just to microwaving everything, fast-forwarding through life, and we never have learned this value of waiting. And you can really actually see that. I think one of the easiest ways to see that is in, in how people date today, right? Like, you don't even have to, like, talk to someone in person anymore. <laughs> you don't have to get to know someone. You don't have to go up to them, uh, you know, and have the awkward interactions. We, we, we've expedited all of that. Now we just send a text to someone we've seen on social media and say, hey, um, you know, let's talk. And, and in fact, maybe, maybe even more than that, maybe like, hey, um, let's hook up. Or, hey, send me some pictures of yourself that uh, should be in a magazine only in like the 60s. You know, <laughs> this is where our culture has, has taken us with that kind of expedited mentality where, you know, we want to get and cut to the chase so much. Uh, maybe it's really left us without a greater hope. I hope that makes sense. Um, because I want us to be able to decide for ourselves, is waiting really the enemy? Is, is waiting really the, the thing that we want to fight against? Is waiting the, something we want to really cut out of our lives? Um, but maybe we want to see the value of it. Um, because how will we ever have hope if we first don't learn to wait? If they are connected to one another, as I have explained. So, as I have uh, kind of told you... Um, I'd, I'd like us to, to consider this whole thing called the kingdom of heaven. Because um, this is uh, interesting, because as the kingdom of heaven is ushered in with the coming of Christ and then setting up in his ministry uh, this and then ultimately sealing that fate in the death and resurrection, and then it became the time of the reign of Christ on earth. But as he leaves heaven, he leaves behind uh, this reign to his disciples. And it talks about this in Romans chapter 1. So those that followed him, excuse me, it's Acts chapter 1. Those that followed him uh, were left. And, uh, and it's accounted here in Acts and how this kind of broke down. It's really interesting. Because as Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, to be at, sit at the right hand of God in the throne, he, he says some things to his disciples that are quite important things. And we know these things. And it says this, it says, um, on one occasion while they were eating with him, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father, 
the Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The, one of the, the, the first statement of Christ in Acts is this, wait. You know, don't leave, don't go anywhere, just, just wait. Wait here for my gift, wait, wait here for my spirit to move. Um, just wait, because if you do, something great is ha- going to happen. And I don't want you to miss it. Would, can you imagine with one of the 12 uh, or 11, depending on the timeline, missed that conversation or, or happened not to be in the upper room when uh, God, uh, the Holy Spirit, just empowered them to speak in the tongues and change and set up the church? What if they missed out on that? What if they fast forwarded past that because they had to do something? What would that have left us in history? Where would have left them? You know, what Jesus goes on uh, in this story in Acts, it says that as they gathered around him, they asked him, Lord, um, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus uh, responds, and I'm not getting into timelines and uh, all the teachings of eschatology at all, but he makes it really clear that he, it's not for them to know. It's not for him to know. It's only for the Father. He's not, the dates and times the Father has said, he says, and it's for his authority. But he says, you'll receive power when you get the Holy Spirit, and you'll go be my witnesses. You have something to do. And he ascends into heaven, and he leaves them. But it says this, after he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes in the cloud. And the cloud hid him from their sight. And as they were looking intently up into the sky, suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking at the sky? This same Jesus, the same man, the same God, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There again, the promise, I'm coming. He's coming. And now the church has awaited for now 2,000 years nearly this coming. And that's why I think sometimes we don't really wait that well. Because we've been waiting a long time, right? And so some maybe have doubted the waiting. We've doubted the words or we've grown weary in this waiting. Or, or we just, I think many of us, we just get forgetful. We forget that we're waiting for something. We forget. And I want us just to be reminded. I want us to be reminded that our greatest hope is not going to be found here. Our greatest hope is not... Now, when Christ came and He died and He suffered and bled and He made a way for you to have a relationship with Him, He set up His reign, but that reign is in your heart. And for you, the victory is won. But everyone really knows if they break it down, you were saved from your sin and the judgment of sin, but you weren't really fully saved from sin. In fact, you are being saved, and you won't be fully saved from the effects of sin that is all around you until you are like Christ, and that's His promise, that you will join me in the sky, and you will be as I am. You will be glorified. That's what we wait for is our glorification. That's why the Scriptures talk so much about uh, we wait patiently. We wait on glory. We wait on the, this, this glorious day where all will be made right in us and in our world. That second coming when, when the Lord of Lords and King of Kings comes back and gets His throne fully established on earth, that is what we need to champion. And when I say that, I mean, that is what we need to be about. You know, everything up until that, we have many hopes. We've been teaching about the many hopes. We have hopes in Christ and the relationship we have with Him. And every promise that He's made along the way, we have many hopes. I, I don't, I, I'm hopeful that the coronavirus is not going to overtake us. I'm hopeful in all the promises the Word has laid out in Christ. In fact, in the Word of God, it says um, that every promise in Christ is, or every promise made in God is a yes in Christ. It, like Jesus is a fulfillment of that. But, here we have, we're still in this falling, resolu- wait, waiting to hit the resolution in this story, in this narrative. And the question is, is how do we wait while we get there? Uh, I don't know, uh, as I was talking about a restaurant earlier, make make you think about the times you've been to um, 
a, gr a really nice restaurant, one you've really anticipated and hoped to be to, and you're excited because you heard about all the great entrees they had, and you got there, and you were really pumped, and then you ordered an appetizer. Right? You, you made the, the fatal flaw, and you ordered the appetizer, and you consume that appetizer, and then the main course comes, and what do you do? You pack it up, take it home, and the next day, hopefully, you microwave it. And somehow, I think, we take these hopes of Christ uh, that are really meant to be appetizers. They're just tastes of what is really coming uh, in the full fulfillment of God's kingdom, and when we will finally be shed completely of the strains of sin, and we we take it and consume it as if, and this is going to be everything. And we do that with sin and everything else. We look at all these menial hopes when we and, and somehow then fast forward and miss that we're meant to just be fully waiting for our coming king. The hope we hold out it's for our coming king. And I don't want that to be overshadowed by anything, whether it be sin, struggle, distraction, forgetfulness. I don't want it to be overshadowed even by the little hopes that I hold out in my faith in Christ and His promises. But if we, if we think and we hold out to this, and we understand that just like Robin Hood, that someday our king's coming back. And we'll be joined up into them with the sky. Some believe we'll even fight in the battle of Armageddon with them. But regardless, we will reign victorious with Jesus forever. This is a glorious thought. Why don't we think about it more? Well, I want to just tell you a few other thoughts about this as we close out. And, and thoughts that have come from Jesus himself from Matthew chapter 24, where we were before. And here, um, we... We want to look um, at, at what, you know, he's trying to convey in these last days on earth as he's teaching about what's to come um, in, uh, in his second coming. So Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is breaking down for us um, what he is uh, hoping for us as we wait. And so he tells us how to wait, and I want you to get how to wait. I want you to understand what we ought to be doing as, as waiting on the Lord is called to us. Um, he first gives us this in, in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 45. He says, um, Who is the faithful and wise servant? The one the master has put in charge of his other servants in his household and gave them to give them their food at the proper time. Uh, and it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing that when he returns. And so the picture is a master and trusts everything to uh, us. And, and we're supposed to take care of people. We're supposed to love people. We're supposed to stay busy. We're supposed to work. And it goes on to say, but what if that servant was evil and he abused the people and he beat them and he didn't feed them and he just hoarded it for himself and he, he was a drunkard and hung out with people and just partied it up? What would that mean? Would the master be happy when he came back and found that? And that's the correlation that we find when Jesus starts to talk about the kingdom coming and what we ought to be doing. We ought to feed his sheep, <laughs> we ought to take care of the people around us. And he's entrusted this kingdom to us. Why wouldn't we um, be good lords of it, good um, servants, faithful servants? And so that really speaks to, I think, what the believer's role is. But then there's this other role, the role of uh, people that don't know Christ. And that's where this par parable that comes next in chapter 25, a parable that ten virgins comes in where... Here are these 10 virgins waiting for this uh, groom to come and this wedding banquet to happen. The ushering in of the kingdom is what we're looking at. And it, it's just telling us a little bit of analogy. Some will be prepared for that, some won't. Some of those virgins, they came prepared, some of them did not. And when the bridegroom came, Jesus came, they weren't prepared. And they missed the party. And for us, we all want to make sure we're not missing the party. We're not missing the boat. So the message throughout chapter 25, chapter 24, and these various parables talking about is really this. Be ready. Because he's going to come like a thief in the night. He's going to come when, when you don't expect it. And we should, we should be vigilant. We should be ready. We should be busy. And when he comes, we should be finding ourselves doing that which would please him. Um, and expanding the kingdom on earth 
taking back some ground that has been lost while we wait on Him to ultimately take it all. Um, I hope that makes sense to you, and I hope that points out and points to our role now, because we have a role. We have a role in the kingdom, so many things for us to focus on and do, but let's not get busied so much that we don't just remember how much and think about how much there's a resolution coming, and that um, we always really need to be able to to come to this place where um, we we remember Jesus is going to fix this. Doesn't that give you hope? Whatever you're facing, whatever your struggle is, whatever you're battling, Jesus is is going to fix it all, and and He can seal your inheritance with Him if you trust Him. And in that sealing and in that, that, that great connection that will carry you into heaven, it's eternal life. We can hope that all of this, all this will end and the king will reign because hope is indeed on the way. Well, I hope this ministered to you. And as you take this day to reflect on the hope you have, whatever tries to steal it away or distract it, you push past to the future that no matter what you face or what comes, no matter what sufferings, nothing can steal the hope of glory. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I love you and I trust you with our world. I long for your coming. I didn't always long for it, but God, I I can't wait to see our King make this earth what it should be. As Romans told us, um, it's groaning. All of creation groans for the moment when the sons of man will be revealed, when the resolution would happen, and when all this would be fixed. So God, we thank you for that great hope, and we hold it out today, and we run towards you today, serving you, loving you, and not forgetting you because of it. In Christ's name, amen. A good Thank you for joining us online today. It was a pleasure worshiping with you. If you guys have any questions about who New Life is, what we do for our community, how you can serve, please go to our website, nlccwb.org. From there, you're going to be able to get a lot of information about who we are, what we do, and you'll also be able to click a link that you can let us know that, hey, this was your first time worshiping with us today. Please feel free to reach out and let us know how this service was able to connect with you and how we can be praying for you or if there's any needs that you have. We love you guys. Have a great week.